Hello, this is Tom Harris of the International Climate Science Coalition. I'm speaking to you from a very cold and blustery Ottawa, Canada, late in the day on December 14th, 2010. As you can see around us, we're in the middle of a snowstorm. This is our first major storm of the year. So as I stand here freezing my hands, holding this camera, the last thing I know most people around me are thinking of is global warming. But let's have a look at the Cancun Climate Conference and what was accomplished. The environmental groups are telling you that, well, there was something accomplished. They're trying to boost people's enthusiasm for a coming year of 2011, which promises to be a real Donnybrook. People on the right, on the other hand, are saying, ah, nothing was accomplished at all. Climate realists can relax. This is just more of the UN's baffle garb about what they're planning to do someday if they ever get the money. Well, I would say that, in fact, they're not, neither side is right. There were some very significant things accomplished, some things that we should be very afraid of and we should be getting ready to oppose throughout 2011. First of all, many people are saying, well, nothing legally binding was established in Cancun that would result in mitigation targets being legally bound to, as well as adaptation funding. Well, of course, that was not going to happen. After the fiasco in Copenhagen, there were a lot of bloody noses that went home there. And as you can see, the snow is really picking up here. The weather is cooperating, and I'm going to have to change hands, or I'll freeze my hand. But anyway, here we go. Uh, the bottom line is that there was a lot accomplished. What they did is they succeeded in setting up a framework to accomplish legally binding targets for both mitigation and adaptation throughout 2011, so that by the end of 2011, if they get what they're shooting for, there will be very serious targets agreed to in South Africa at what is called COP17 uh, in December of 2011. Well, what we should be afraid of is this. Coming out of Copenhagen, there was in fact great dejection among the climate campaigners. They had failed to get any of the legally binding agreements that they had hoped to achieve. So the best thing that they could do was to rekindle the spirit among the climate alarmist movement. And they did that in spades, okay? The bottom line is that their movement now is greatly revitalized, and that is something to be very, very concerned about. They've also set forward the structure, the framework, on which the various legal agreements for binding mitigation uh, limits as well as adaptation funding, they now can set these up throughout 2011. Now, there were some very specific things that were agreed to as well. There were some very major hurdles that were overcome which had been stumbling blocks in the past. One of them in particular was to do with monitoring. Uh, countries like China did not want to have any monitoring allowed at all. But in fact, now they have agreed that monitoring will be allowed on projects, mitigation projects that were funded by foreign money. So that's a big advance for the climate alarmist side. The Environment Minister of India has agreed to be the head honcho, so to speak, the leader of the monitoring crowd. Now, this is quite a concern as well, because that means that India will probably also have to subject themselves to monitoring uh, and surveillance by the United Nations controllers. Now, we have to realize that for the first time, virtually all of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are now brought under the purvey of the UNFCCC. There isn't yet legally binding uh, controls, but they are now demanding very serious reports from all countries as to how much greenhouse gas reductions are being enabled. This is very similar to the early days of the European Union, where, as Christopher Monckton wrote up in his recent excellent piece, their first step towards eventually taking over more and more control was indeed to insist on reports and monitoring and that sort of thing. And of course, if you think back to World War II, or actually before World War II, that was one of the first things the Nazis did with various populations within uh, Germany, unfortunately. So this business of reporting, monitoring, that's a very important step forward for climate alarmists. There were a number of other advances. For example, there was a green fund established. Now, of course, that green fund where they get the money is a good question. It's not legally binding that people contribute, but that is to be administered by the UNFCCC. And that's a bit of a problem uh, because half of them, half of the people administering the fund will be from developing nations, many of whom are, of course, dictatorships. So that has, you know, has ripe for corruption, to say the least. For the first three years, at least, the World Bank is going to be uh, running this green fund, this $100 billion a year transfer from the West to the developing world. Now, uh, allied with that, of course, there are a number of other new clauses uh, in the Cancun Agreement, which now becomes part of the UNFCCC. For the first time, the word loss, okay, in other words, uh, losses due to extreme weather events have now been incorporated into the agreements. 
And this is a significant advance. It opens the door for possible agreements later where there will be indeed the possibility of legal challenges, uh, lawsuits, uh, you know, requirements that the Western world pay out after natural disasters that in fact they are blaming on us. So there's a lot of things there that may open as a result of this new inclusion of the word loss in the treaty. Uh, also, they've incorporated part of the Copenhagen Accord, which they call the King Canute um, Clause. And that is the desire to limit world temperatures to no more than two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Okay? Now, of course, that's ridiculous. It's quite impossible. And, of course, who does the measuring and how do you actually determine what world temperatures even are? Uh, but the bottom line is that that is now part of the UNFCCC. Countries have also agreed, they re-agreed, really, um, with Article 2, that's referenced very strongly, Article 2 of the UNFCCC, which says that we will work to limit greenhouse gases to prevent dangerous human-caused uh, change to the climate. Okay, so this is just something they've reiterated and indeed is something that uh, makes no sense, but all countries have signed up to it. Now, so what I'm saying in, in conclusion is that, in fact, there are a number of significant advances. If you think back uh, to before the conference, the best that could be achieved has in fact been achieved by climate campaigners. They would not have gotten legal agreements. We know that before we even started. But if you were to draw a flowchart of what could be accomplished and what should and has to be accomplished before legal agreements, then you would say indeed that the Cancun Climate Accord has in fact done exactly what it was supposed to do. So over 2011, we're going to see a very intense war to try to flesh out the skeleton or the framework that was just established over the last couple of weeks. So look forward to 2011. Battles are coming. And it appears that the cold weather is coming not just to Canada, but to a lot of the Northern Hemisphere. Thanks for your time.